All right, welcome to the Big Texas Podcast presented by Texas Young Republicans. I'm your host, Jordan Overturf, coming to you on Memorial Day 2020. And before we get to my guest, I want to take just a brief moment to pay respects and honor those Americans who fought and died for our country. Uh, Memorial Day is set aside for us to honor those who fought in combat and died, who gave the ultimate sacrifice for the freedoms that we enjoy. Um, This is a tradition that dates back to the Civil War. It was officially created in 1971, and we honor these fallen soldiers the last Monday of May every year. So if you are a family member or a active duty uh, military service member or veteran who has served with one of these great patriots. Today is reserved for you to tell their story. This is a great opportunity for us to remember uh, who they were, what they fought for, and more importantly, celebrate the lives that they lived. These are great Americans, great heroes that we need to uh, keep their stories alive. So make sure that it, even if you're just with one friend today, you can share that story so that their legacy lives on. My guest today is Josh Weingarner. He is a Republican candidate in the runoff election for Congressional District 13. Now, those who aren't paying attention to the election calendar, we've pushed back our primary election runoff to July 14th. Early voting begins on June 29th. They've added an extra week of early voting uh, because of the coronavirus response. So, Set your calendars June 29th for early voting. July 14th is election day. Uh, I had a great time talking to Josh last week about his race, about what got him involved, all of his advocacy work for farmers and ranchers. And we get into the specific issues that uh, Congressional District 13 and that portion of Amarillo has been dealing with during this response uh, with the meatpacking plants. How crucial our farmers and ranchers have been during this response, making sure that our grocery store shelves are full and that we continue to keep the uh, food supply chain active. So thank you again to Josh for joining us. uh, And we'll have more about the, the special election details and stuff after this episode. But as usual, I am talking too much. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, Mr. Josh Weingarner. Tell us a bit about you. You know, we know we've got a runoff election coming up in July. For those who don't know about you or didn't get a chance to learn about you during the primary, give us a brief rundown of your background and experience. Sure. And you mentioned, so the runoff date is July 14th. Early voting will start June 29th. Um, so it's important, especially given the how the fact that we don't know exactly how voting is going to take place, I think taking advantage of early voting is going to be key. So make sure that uh, you know where your voting locations are so you can get out and vote. Uh, and probably vote early because that you'll have fewer people there with you on that those days. Uh, so I grew up in uh, Spearman, Texas, very top of the panhandle. Uh, my mom was a school nurse and uh, uh, almost all the way through my, my, my uh, education Undergrad or my elementary education, and then uh, my dad was a John Deere salesman in Spearman. So I, I learned at an early age how to work hard. Uh, they really inspired me, pushed me, and uh, uh, since my dad was uh, with uh, farmers all the time, I got to be a hired hand for several people, you know, whether I wanted to or not. So uh, I, got, I got some experience and then really learned how to work hard, and, and that's what drove me into the college. Uh, to where I, I studied history at McMurray University, went over to Hardin Simmons uh, in Abilene also for graduate school and decided that uh, I didn't need a PhD, that I wanted to, it was time for me to get a job. So uh, I had the opportunity to uh, go up to Washington and work for uh, Senator Phil Graham. Started at the bottom, answering phones, uh, reading constituent mail, doing constituent communication, and uh, Worked with him for two years. When he retired, Senator Foreman came, was elected. He hired me on to do the same thing. Did that for a bit and then transitioned over to the policy side where I worked on agriculture, small business, and trade issues for the senator. And then also got to really, and then I think this is important and something that the senator recognized that was needed is that 
some of the issues that weren't in my portfolio but had a different impact on the rural area than they, than they did in the urban areas, I could get brought in on some of those to, to discuss, you know, okay, what's the implication of this on in Spearman or in Amarillo or Wichita Falls versus Dallas and Fort Worth and Houston and San Antonio. So uh, it, it was a good way for me to sp- get exposed to a number of different issues. Uh, and then in, in 2006, um, I had the opportunity to move back home and uh, work for the Texas Cattle Feeders Association, uh, representing the members of the, the cattle feeding industry. Uh, our small business affiliates, and then the farmers and ranchers that are also part of our, our organization, making sure that they had a voice uh, in both Washington and Austin uh, to ensure that uh, we their issues were, were front and center and that we had a way to push back against the, the regulatory environment that was coming down on us. Well, with your background and experience uh, in, in the farming and ranching uh, side of things, uh, the last few years had to have been uh, pretty active for you in engaging with the farmers, uh, you know, with the U.S.-Mexico-Canada agreement, and now with this coronavirus response uh, and, and the issues that are coming up with, along the lines of the food supply chain. Um, what are those conversations like, uh, and who do you feel like you're hearing from most uh, from the agriculture and ranching community? Sure. So I, you're right. I, I was very involved in, in the USMCA trade agreement, in addition to trade agreements with Japan and uh, with, with China. Even. Uh, when we got through our phase one trade agreement with them, now we're, we're exporting a significant amount of uh, agricultural commodities to China, which is a, a big bonus for, especially for the cattle industry and the beef, the cattle beef industry, because uh, we had previously been locked out of China. So that pre- created a, a great opportunity for, for us. And and around the world, people know that we have the best beef and uh, that they're always looking for that. So being able to, uh, to, to increase the opportunities for our producers and, and provide uh, good quality food for, for people around the world is, is what our members really want to do. Uh, so been very involved in that. And then with, with COVID, obviously there's been an impact on, on agriculture. Uh, and it, it, it's been hard uh, on, on agriculture and in the cattle industry because of the the issues that have resulted from the supply chain interruption. Uh, and, it, and it was kind of a twofold uh, issue. First being that the product that we normally send, uh, about 50% of that is meant for hotels, restaurants, and institutions. Um, and about 50% of the food that we consume, you and I consume, is outside of the home. So we're, we're taking half of the product that we normally send to those institutions that are now closed or, or significantly uh, have significantly less business, and we're trying to transition that into, okay, how, now how do we put that into the marketplace through the retail uh, establishment that isn't used to handling that same type of product. So that that was the first uh, hurdle we had to overcome. And now we're dealing with the fact that, okay, we've got issues with our supply chain from uh, our workers in the meat packing plants that, that have become infected with the disease and it slowed down that process. So now we, we're, we're getting through that uh production is slower, but it is still happening. We don't have a food shortage or a, 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 a crisis going on. We have plenty of beef. We have plenty of cattle to process. We just have to get them through the processing side, get them out into the retail case for consumers. So uh, I know that a lot of the discussion has, especially with coronavirus, has been about the urban centers, about the, you know, these highly populated dense areas. Uh, you know, for you running in such a broad swath of a rural district uh, and for it to, I don't. I don't want to be overly critical for a situation I don't have any inside knowledge of, but from the outside appearance, it seems like the issue at the meatpacking plants came a lot later uh, than the overall response Uh, for you as someone who's wanting to represent a largely rural district. How do you 
increase the power of that voice with so many urban representatives gobbling up the oxygen in the discussion? Well, and I think I think the coronavirus situation is going to help that actually because now people in the cities understand how important the rural areas are. Absolutely, we're where oil and gas is produced. We're where food is produced, and when they recognize that when something like that happens in the rural area, it's going to impact us too. So being able to develop those relationships with colleagues from those urban centers, the suburban areas, and educating them on the importance of food production and talking to them about the specifics of it and maybe bringing them out here and let them see. Uh, Those things are important because unless you've seen it with your own eyes, it's hard to really comprehend. So allowing them to uh, get more familiar with it and uh, just educate them on on the whole process. Well, that's certainly something that uh, we're trying to do with this podcast. Uh, But another thing that we're trying to figure out is what are the issues that voters should be thinking about right now? You know, there's so much discussion uh, about the election coming up in November and how that's going to be carried out. But what specific issues do you think voters should have at the front of their mind right now? Yeah. And before I answer that, let me go back to your previous question just for a second, because Mm -hmm. There's another issue that we're dealing with in the rural areas that the urban and suburban centers may not understand completely, but it's become even more apparent uh, to us, and that is uh, the the rural broadband issue. Mm -hmm. Um, I have two kids, uh, and we were educating our kids at home at the same time that my wife and I were both working from home. So you've got two devices running Zoom meetings. You've got two more devices doing Google Classroom. And you suck the bandwidth out, you know, to the, the point that somebody has to leave and, and go somewhere else to work. So it's a real issue, and it's also an impediment to uh, us being able to continue economic development in our rural areas, being able to, to have that, that bandwidth and provide some other services at the same time, whether it be telemedicine or um, uh, just attracting companies to, to move in there. They, they need to know that, that they have a secure and a, a, a reliable uh, internet connection. So uh, that's that's another issue that, that's important for us in the rural areas to continue to talk about with, with our, our colleagues in the city. Absolutely. Uh, and it, let's continue on that thread because uh, I, for one, have been a longtime proponent of getting more rural broadband access Uh, And when you look at the overall cost to provide broadband versus the amount of money that the state and the federal government is spending on roads, uh, it seems like this is a great time to have the conversation about work from home opportunities in rural areas. I I mean, again, I'm not an expert on any of this stuff, but I like to have the conversation and, and ask the question, Uh, is this the better answer for us to spread out the density from our cities to create more opportunities to allow smaller towns to grow, but also give businesses an access, a a, a group of potential employees that are out there ready to go to work from their homes? Yeah, that, that, that is exactly right. I mean, I can't tell you how many people that I graduated from high school with that would love to be back here where they grew up raising their kids here, but they just can't because their jobs are in cities. If they had the ability to do their jobs remotely from, from the panhandle, they would do it uh, because they want that same opportunity. So I think, yes, now is the, the time. We, we've seen that we can, we can work from home. Uh, there are some challenges, but uh, as we just discussed, but we can, we can get through those challenges and, uh, create an environment where we do have more people uh, living in the rural areas and working remotely into the cities and traveling there when they need. Uh, and, and as you mentioned, with, with construct, road construction and uh, other infrastructure uh, projects that are going on, the perfect time to be laying uh, fiber optic cable and other things. If we're, if we're already going to dig, you know, dig a ditch for a pipe, you know, whether it's a sewer line or something else, why not, you know, utilize the fact that, that there's already a ditch? Let's lay some fiber optic at the same time. Yeah. Or, you know, let's let's try to work all this stuff together so we're not having to come out multiple times to do these different projects. 
Yeah, and the Texas legislature had a solution for that uh, this last session where they made it possible for electric co-ops to provide broadband internet through their existing right-of-way. Like, that's a smart use of already purchased right-of-way. Uh, these electric co-ops serve rural communities uh, pretty much exclusively. And so, uh, you know, this seems to really open up the door for that. So rural broadband, top of the list, is something voters should be thinking about right now. What are some of those other key issues that you think voters should be thinking about, uh, especially as they get ready to vote in this July 14th primary runoff? Right. Well, I, I think, I mean, obviously we've got economic impacts that are a result of COVID that we've got to have front of mind. And it's trying, it, it, it's, it's making sure that we're doing what we need to do to stimulate our economy and get our economy back on track. And part of that, and the president did this just recently, uh, let's, and I agree with him 100%, let's go through all these regulatory uh, burdens that exist today, look at what regulations are really necessary, which ones aren't, and get rid of the ones that are really an impediment. If they're not doing something that's necessary, and we've relaxed a number of those during COVID, uh, and we don't seem to be having a problem as a result, let's look at those, Get rid of the ones that aren't worse, that aren't necessary, that are just burdensome for somebody's pet project, and create a, a better business environment so that we can stimulate our economy, so that we can continue to encourage that entrepreneurial spirit that that we're known for, especially in the district, so that we can get out there and and uh, and work hard and do a job that people want done, uh, and provide a service. That I don't know how many times I've talked to uh, young people that kind of back to what I was saying earlier, they'd love to be home and start a new business, but the, the capital outlay or the regulation, whether it be city, state, or federal, that they have to, or all three that they have to comply with, it's just so cost prohibitive that they can't do what it is they want to do. Well, I think that's the wrong environment for us to have. We, we need to have a, a more business-friendly environment. I think Texas can lead the way in that. Um, we are a lot better than other other states, but uh, there's more that we we can even do. Absolutely. Well, to that end, you know, you have spent so much of your career, you know, fighting for the original, you know, the original pioneers uh, of this state, you know, the farmers and ranchers who really were the first ones to set up shop here in Texas. Uh, but as you look at the broader landscape and you think back on the primary, you know, you were in a crowded field. What do you think it was about you and your campaign that helped you stand out and make it to this runoff? Well, I, I think a lot of it was just that I'm relatable. I'm, I'm from the district. Um, I'm born and raised here. My family and I live here, work here, go to church here. I, I'm, I'm like your neighbor down the street. So uh, that, that was the, uh, that, that was one of the keys, I think. And, and then on top of that, the fact that I do have a policy background, that I understand the issues and I've worked in these issues uh, and can, can really hit the ground running. Uh, my learning curve is a lot less than anybody else's because I, I, I've been involved in, in, in the process for so long. So being able to, to, to go straight to uh, Congress and, and not losing a beat uh, is, is going to be really beneficial for this district. Uh, we also, some of the other issues, though, that, that we've got to really keep working on, uh, we've got to continue to, to, to work on building the wall, securing our border, keeping the drug traffickers and human traffickers out, uh, getting a handle on, uh, on illegal immigration. We've got to stop that and, and make sure that we don't have people coming across the border that we don't know who they are and where they're going. And then uh, we've got to continue to protect life and, uh, and defend our Second Amendment. Uh, so, so those are some other key issues that we've really got to keep watching because as we've seen, um, our, the other side is continuing to try to put all of their propaganda into any sort of stimulus bill, the, the new version of the stimulus bill for COVID. So uh, they're throwing every one of their socialist type policies into the mix and we've got to continue to keep our eyes focused and, and make sure that we're ready to push back on that. And, and, and we are, but we, we just have to continue to, to be laser focused and not say it's just for economic recovery. We've got to also continue to, to really hold true to our value system. 
Well, I'm glad you brought up what's happening in other states because I, I kind of have a twofold question for you uh, where the latter will, will address what we've seen elsewhere. But the big question that a lot of young Republicans especially face uh, from their peers is, why are you a Republican? So I want to ask you right now, Josh Weingarner, why are you a Republican? I'm a Republican because I believe in the Constitution. I believe in lower taxes. I believe in the, uh, the sanctity of life. Uh, and, and I believe on reducing spending uh, and, and making sure that we're operating you know, within our means. And, and those are all Republican principles that, that I hold for. Well, to that end, you have these core set of values, right? And from our earliest foundations in the family, we are imbued with these core values. Now, as we see the response and the fallout and a lot of the commentary that is coming out, it seems like more and more people who find themselves originally leaning to the left are starting to understand what Republicans are standing for. Do you personally feel like this response has opened the eyes of some people who would have been considering voting Democrat in November? And do you think they will change their minds in the general election? I think that there are a lot of people that will because they, they see that, that, that our party is talking about solutions to recover from this crisis, whereas the other party is trying to lop on additional wish list items into the mix that will do the exact opposite. It will impede growth. It will continue to, to make us as citizens more dependent on the federal government rather than less. And, and I think that's a key distinction is that we as Republicans, we want to have the least amount of government interference in our lives as possible. And it, it appears that the Democrats want the exact opposite, that they want citizenry to be dependent on the government for everything. And I think one of the examples we can see in that is the, the requirement that we added an additional $600 to the unemployment benefit for people uh, that, are, that have been laid off as a result of COVID. The, the idea sounds really good, but as you talk to more and more business owners, um, they will tell you that, hey, this is, uh, this is really creating a situation for me. Uh, it's a significant issue because I can't get... I can't hire my wait staff. I can't hire drivers. I can't hire other people because they can make more sitting at home doing nothing than they can by coming back to work. Absolutely. And I, those are the issues that really differentiate us. Yeah. Uh, and that's a narrative that continues to increase as people uh, talk about the stimulus packages that have been passed uh, and the effect that they are having here locally in Texas, but also across the country. Uh, I want to get back to the campaign though. Uh, you know, June 1st is the official wide open date for Texas. Texas summer is going to be here uh, for you and your campaign. What's the plan? Uh, you know, as this state opens up, uh, are you going to be doing more in-person activities? Do you have any plans to block walk? Uh, how are you going to be engaging voters when June 1st comes here? Yes, we are going to be back to more traditional type of campaigning, but we're not going to abandon what we've been doing uh, from the technology that we've used to campaign. I mean, it, it's very effective, uh, especially in a district that's 40,000 square miles and you've got 40, 41 counties. Being able to do four meetings in four hours rather than driving four hours to do one meeting mm -hmm. means that you can really get in front of more people that way. So we're going to continue to utilize our technology, but we're going to get back out and be more face to face. We're going to, we're going to, you know, we're getting our, our signs back up and, and you know, where we live in the Panhandle, it's real windy. So April and, and March are not the best times to have four by eight signs on T-Post and flopping in the wind. So May is a, is a time for us to get those back out, be a lot more visible, get out. And, and uh, you know, it's hard for me not to just go in and start shaking hands and giving hugs. So that, that's something that, that we're, we're, we're working back through. But, yeah, we're, we're, we're engaged. Uh, we're getting more active every day. Uh, more visibly active, I would say. And then, uh, but we also have to ha keep in mind that in, in this district, we do still have some significant hotspots. So June 1st, while it is the official day, we may have some, some restrictions here in, in, in the county that I live in, in fact, uh, 
uh, in, in Randall County and then also Potter and Moore, and there may be others where we're still dealing with uh, an increase in cases uh, because we were slower to to receive the, the or slower to feel the impact of the disease. Mm-hmm. Well, and people who have been following that are learning so much more about that economy up there with those meatpacking plants and how how spread out it is. And I want to ask you, with people who come in from Oklahoma to work in those meatpacking plants, uh, from a public servant standpoint, wh- how do you service kind of their needs, even though they're not voting citizens, but they are contributing to the economy locally there in your district? Right. So our district is unique in the fact that, uh, I mean, take Amarillo, for example, we're closer to five other state capitals than we are to our own. Uh, and Amarillo is kind of a hub city where we, we get a lot of uh, sales tax dollars from New Mexico, Oklahoma, Kansas, southeastern Colorado. Uh, so we're kind of the bigger, biggest uh, shopping uh, retail area in the region. So having that uh, continuous back and forth, and it's also where you know a lot of uh, VA uh, patients come from those other states because we have a large VA hospital here in Amarillo. Mm-hmm. Uh, so our proximity to other states does create a situation where um, we've got non-citizens, I guess you were the non-residents of our state coming in, uh, and, and, and they're shoppers. They're, uh, they're, some of them go to church in Texas, too. I mean, we have a lot of cities that actually, there's a, you know, a line that goes through the middle of town, and part of them live in Oklahoma, and part of them live in, in, in Texas. So uh, it, it's not uncommon to, uh, to go back and forth across the borders on a, on a very routine basis. The, uh, the thing I would say, though, is that those people in those other states are very like-minded with the rest of us in, uh, in those parts of the states. Now, you know, I mentioned Colorado. Uh, southeastern Colorado is a lot more like the Texas Panhandle than it is like Denver. Uh, you know, same thing with, with eastern New Mexico. They're a lot more like the Texas Panhandle than they are uh, Albuquerque and Santa Fe. So... Uh, we are more commonly aligned linked, and we also have a, a similar economy. You know, it's a very agriculture and oil and gas based economy in all these different areas. So we get along well, and we have a similar understanding of how things need to be done. Excellent. Well, uh, you know, as you get ready for this final stretch of the runoff, uh, here is your chance to speak directly to the voters there in Texas 13. What is is your message. What do you think voters should know most about you? What are the qualifications that you think make you best suited uh, for this role? And why should they vote for you in November or, and sorry, on July 14th in the runoff? Right. Well, I I think I'll start out by saying just this. I was very reluctant to get into this race, not because I can't do the job, but because I never saw myself doing it. It's not been a dream. It's not been something. I, I don't want to be a career politician. Um, I, what got me into the, to, to this race was two things. When I talked to others about their interests, um, they said they weren't, but they thought I should. And that caused me to go back and reflect and pray on it. And for three church services in a row, my wife and I were sitting there, and two of them were about using the talents that God gave you to give back and to honor him and to help others. And then the last one was, listen, when I tell you what I want you to do. And that, that really impacted me and said, you know what, this, this is something we've got to do. I've got the skill set. I've got the background to be able to go and represent this area and, uh, and the people of this area. And it's my obligation to, to try. And, and that's what I'm doing. And when I say represent, I'm being literal with that. I'm not running to be a congressman. I'm running to be a representative. I'm running to, uh, be a servant to the people of this district and make sure that they continue to have a voice, uh, deal with the issues that we've talked about previously in this, this podcast. Um, and then also my wife and I made the decision early on that, that we weren't moving to Washington, that uh, I wanted my kids to be part of this community. My wife continued to serve on the school board and be, um, and us continue to go to our church. We're not looking for a new place to live, uh, we're looking for a new place to serve. So I'll commute back and forth. 
And that means I'll always be around my constituents when I'm home. And that's key because we're not bashful. And my constituents will hold me accountable. And if they think that I've done something stupid, they'll tell me. If they think that I'm doing, I'm on the right track, then they'll tell me that too. And I think that's key to making sure that we, I'm really doing the job that I've been hired to do by the election. Uh, so that, that's a big, uh, th- those are kind of some big things that are, that are driving me. And then I think the other difference is that it just, I'm local. I, I know the people of this district. I know the issues that matter. And I represent the same cultural values that the people in the district. So uh, that's, the, that's the message that I'm going to continue to talk about. And we'll continue to talk about the issues too, uh, protecting life and uh, securing our borders and uh, helping our economy. Uh, but when, when it all boils down to, I'm a conservative Christian that's from here and that's uh, just like my neighbor down the road. Excellent. Well, I know that you've also recently uh, picked up some endorsements. Uh, is it correct that State Senator Charles Perry has endorsed your campaign? That's correct. And what are some of the other endorsements that your campaign has received uh, since getting into the, this race? Sure. So I have the endorsement of the Texas Alliance for Life, uh, the home builders, the uh, uh, realtors, uh, cattle feeders, cattle raisers, uh, pretty much all of the agriculture groups. And then also the uh, we've got Matt Thornberry, Mike Conaway, uh, former senator and Texas Tech Chancellor Bob Duncan, uh, former party chair Tom Meckler, who's also from Amarillo. Um, I mean, there's a there's a pretty exhausting list that you talked about over the border. A fr- a Congressman Frank Lucas from Oklahoma uh, has also endorsed me. Uh, so and, and he's looking at it this way too. Something else to, to bring up is that. Uh, Agriculture is very important to our district, and uh, we won't have a Texan on the Agriculture Committee once Mike Conway retires as a Republican. So having somebody that can go in there and understands agriculture and get on that committee and work for the benefit of Texas, and and as Chairman Lucas has said, you know, I'm as close to Amarillo as I am to any place else. So you know, you re- you'll represent us just like you will the state of Texas. So I think that's another key factor there. Well, that's a great partnership to form uh, before you head up uh, to D.C. Uh, Josh, we wish you best of luck. For those who want to learn more about your campaign, uh, what's your website, social media links, give us all that stuff. Sure, so it's joshweingarner.com, and you can find me on Facebook at at Josh Weingarner for Congress. Excellent. Well, Josh, thank you for your time. Uh, let you get back to the family and your Memorial Day celebrations. Uh, Again, I appreciate it, and we wish you best of luck in the runoff. Great. Thanks, Jordan. Have a great day. You did the same. All right. Thank you again to Josh for joining us. Thank you to you for tuning in. And again, thank you to all of the Patriots who have given their lives. Today is about paying respect to them and giving the honor that they justly deserve. Um, I appreciate you for tuning into this podcast. If you're watching on Facebook or YouTube, or you've downloaded this on iTunes, Spotify, Google podcasts, uh, we have more interviews with candidates coming up as we prepare for this July 14th primary election runoff. A reminder again, early voting begins June 29th. There's two weeks of early voting and then July 14th is election day for the primary election runoff. Uh, There are some heated races on both sides of the aisle and we hope to give you some coverage of that as this race wraps up and as we prepare for the general election in November. And we've got plenty of activities coming up from the Texas Young Republicans. This is your reminder to sign up for our alerts at our website, texasyr.gop. If you're a candidate and you would like to come on this podcast, you can find us on Twitter and Instagram at Big Texas Podcast. Make sure you're following Texas Young Republicans on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Texas YRs. Again, friends, thank you so much for listening. Uh, Make sure you go back and uh, hear from some of the other candidates that we got to interview before the primary. Some of those folks are in a contested primary election runoff. Uh, We hope to bring them back as well. Uh, But thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I hope you had a very fun and safe Memorial Day. Uh, If you're in North Texas, we hope that you weren't impacted by the tornado that touched down or any of the storms that swept across the Lone Star State. Uh, Again, thank you for listening. Please be safe. Be active. Get involved. 2020 is a very important cycle. 
until next time, friends, see you down the road.